Hey, y'all. I'm so tickled. Look how big that is. It was locked on my phone, so, and Ursula told me how to unlock the, what do you call it? Orientation. And I forgot what she said on my phone. But anyway, I got it on the Kindle, so it's cool. So here we go. On the old nurse's story, I think it was called. You'll see it on the title. Once I remember, my darling would have Dorothy go with us to tell us who they all were, for they were all portraits. They were talking about going through all the stuff and seeing the pictures and stuff in the room. Portraits of some of my Lord's family, though Dorothy could not tell us the names of everyone. We had gone through most of the rooms when we came to an old state drawing room over the hall, and there was a picture of Miss Furnival, or as she was called in those days, Miss Grace, for she was the younger sister. Such a beauty she must have been, but with such a set, proud look, and such scorn looking out of her handsome eyes with her eyebrows just a little raised, as if she wondered how anyone could have the impertinence to look at her, and her lip curled at us as we stood there gazing. She had a dress on, the like of which I had never seen before, but it was all the fashion when she was young. A hat of some soft white stiff like beaver pulled a little over her brows, and a beautiful plume of feathers sweeping round it on one side, and her gown of blue satin was open in front to a quilted white stomacher. <coughs> stomacher? Well, to be sure, said I, when I had gazed my fill, flesh is grass, they do say, but who would have thought that Miss Furnival had been such an out-and-out -out beauty to see her now? Yes, said Dorothy, folks change sadly, but if what my master's father used to say was true, Miss Furnival, the elder sister, was handsomer than Miss Grace. Her picture's here somewhere, but if I show it you, you must never let on even to James, that you have seen it. Can the little lady hold her tongue, think, think you? asked she. I was not so sure, for she was such a little sweet, bold, op open-spoken child. So I set her to hide herself, and then I helped Dorothy to turn a great picture that leaned with its face towards the wall and was not hung up as the others were. To be sure, it beat Miss Grace for beauty, and I think for scornful pride, too. Though in that matter, it might be hard to choose. I could have looked at it an hour, but Dorothy seemed half frightened at having shown it to me, and hurried it back again and bade me run to find Miss Rosamond. For that there were some ugly places about the house where she should like, she should like ill for the child to go. I was a brave, high-spirited girl and thought little of what the old woman said, for I liked hide-and-seek as well as any child in the parish, so off I ran to find my little one. As winter drew on and the days grew shorter, I was sometimes almost certain that I heard a noise as if someone was playing on the great organ in the hall. I did not hear it every evening, but... Certainly I did very often, usually when I was sitting with Miss Rosamond, after I had put her to bed and keeping quite still and silent in the bedroom. Then I used to hear it booming and swelling away in the distance. The first night when I went down to my supper, I asked Dorothy who had been playing music, and James said very shortly that I was a G-O-W-K to take the wind, S O U like coughing but soughing among the trees for music but I saw Dorothy look at him very fearfully and Bessie the kitchen maid said something beneath her breath and went quite white I saw they did not like my question so I held my peace till I was with Dorothy alone which I knew I could get a good deal out of her so the next day I watched my time and I coaxed and asked her who it was that played the organ, for I knew that it was the organ and not the wind well enough, for all I had kept silence before James. 
but Dorothy had had her lesson, I warrant, and never a word could I get from her. So then I tried Bessie, though I'd always held my head rather above her as I was, evened to James and Dorothy, and she was a little better than their, their servant. So she said, I must never, never tell, and if ever told, I was never to say she had told me. But it was a very strange noise, and she had heard it many a time, but most of all on winter nights and before storms. And folks did say it was the old Lord playing on the great organ in the hall, just as he used to do when he was alive. But who the old Lord was, or why he played, or why he played on stormy winter evenings in particular, she either could not or would not tell me. Well, I told you I had a brave heart, and I thought it was rather pleasant to have that grand music rolling about the house. Let who would be the player, for now it rose above the great gust of wind and wailed and triumphed just like a living creature. And then it fell to a softness most complete, only it was always music and tunes, so it was nonsense to call it the wind. I thought at first that it might be Miss Furnival who played, unknown to Bessie, but one day when I was in the hall by myself, I opened the organ and peeped all around it, as I had done to the organ in Crosswaite Church once before, and I saw it was all broken and destroyed inside, though it looked so brave and fine, and then, though it was noonday, my flesh began to creep a little, and I shut it up and run away pretty quickly to my own bright nursery and did not like hearing the music for some time after that any more than James and Dorothy did. All this time, Miss, Rose, Miss Rosamond was making herself more and more beloved. The old la ladies liked her to dine with them at their early dinner. James stood behind Miss, Fer Miss Furnival's chair, and I behind Miss Rosamond's all in state, and after dinner she would play about in a corner of the great drawing room as still as any mouse. While Miss Furnival slept, and I had my dinner in the kitchen, but she was glad enough to come to me in the nursery afterwards, for as she said, Miss Furnival was so sad, and Mrs. Stark so dull, but she... but she and were... It's messed up merry enough, and by and by I got not to care for that weird rolling music which did no one harm if we did not know where it came from. That winter <clears throat> was very cold. In the middle of October, the frost began and lasted many, many weeks. I remember one day at dinner, Miss Furnival lifted up her sad, heavy eyes and said to Mrs. Stark, I'm afraid we shall have a terrible winter, in a strange kind of meaning way, but Mrs. Stark pretended not to hear, and talked very loud of something else. My little lady and I did not care for the frost, not we. As long as it was dry, we climbed up the steep brows behind the house, and went up on the fells, which were bleak and bare enough, and there we ran races in the fresh, sharp air. And once we came down by a new path that took us past the two old gnarled holly trees, which grew about halfway down by the east side of the house. But the days grew shorter and shorter, and the old lord, if it was he, played away more and more stormily and sadly on the great organ. One Sunday afternoon, it must have been towards the end of November, I asked Dorothy to take charge of little Missy when she came out of the drawing room. Hey, kitty. <laughs> I had get it in there, but he did. He's under my desk. Kitty, kitty. I hope that's what it was, anyway. Um... asked Dorothy to take charge of little Missy when she came out of the drawing room after Miss Furnival had had her nap, for it was too cold to take her with me to church, and yet I wanted to go. And Dorothy was glad enough to promise, and was so fond of the child that all seemed well. 
and Bessie and I set off very briskly through the sky, though the sky hung heavy and black over the over the white earth, as if the night had never fully gone away, and the air, though still, was very biting. You shall have a file of snow, said Bessie to me, and sure enough, even while we were in church, it came down thick, in great large flakes, so thick it almost darkened the windows. It had stopped snowing before we came out, but it lay soft, thick, and deep beneath our feet as we tramped home. Before we got to the hall, the moon rose, and I think it was lighter then, what with the moon and what with the white dazzling snow than it had been when we went to church between two and three o'clock. I have not told you that Miss Furnival and Mrs. Stark never went to church. They used to read the prayers together in their quiet, gloomy way, they seemed to feel the Sunday very long without their tapestry work to be busy at. So when I went to Dorothy in the kitchen to fetch Miss Rosamond and take her upstairs with me, I did not much wonder when the old woman told me that the ladies had kept the child with them and that she had never come to the kitchen as I had bidden her when she was tired of behaving pretty in the drawing room. So I took off my things and went to find her and bring her to supper in the nursery. But when I went in to the best drawing room, there sat the two old ladies, very still and quiet, dropping out a word now and then, but looking as if nothing so bright and merry as Miss Rosamond had ever been near them. Still, I thought she might be hiding from me. It was one of her pretty ways and that she had persuaded them to look as if they knew nothing about her. So I went softly peeping under this sofa and behind that chair, making believe I was sadly frightened at not finding her. What's the matter, Hester? <clears throat> said Mrs. Stark sharply. I don't know if Miss Furnival had seen me, for as I told you, she was very deaf, and she sat quite still, idly staring into the fire with her hopeless face. I'm only looking for my little rosy posy, replied I, still thinking that the child was there and near me, though I could not see her. Miss Rosamond is not here, said Mrs. Stark. She went away more than an hour ago to find Dorothy, and she too turned and went and went on looking into the fire. My heart sank at this, and I began to wish I had never left my darling. I went back to Dorothy and told her. James was gone out for the day, but she and me and Bessie took lights and went up into the nursery first, and then we roamed over the great large house, calling and entreating Miss Rosamond to come out of her hiding place and not frighten us to death in that way, but there was no answer, no sound. Oh, I said at last, can she have got into the east wing and hidden there? But Dorothy said it was not possible, for that she herself had never been in there. The doors were always locked, and my lord's steward had the keys, she believed. At any rate, neither she nor James had ever seen them, so I said I would go back and see if, after all, she was not hidden in the drawing room, unknown to the old ladies, and if I found her there, I said I would whip her well for the fright she would given me, but I never meant to do it. Well, I went back to the west drawing room and told Mrs. Stark we could not find her anywhere and asked for leave to look all about the furniture there for I thought now that she might have fallen asleep in some warm hidden corner, but no. We looked. Miss Furnival got up and looked, trembling all over. She was nowhere there. Then we set off again, everyone in the house, and looked in all the places we had searched before, but we could not find her. Miss Furnival shivered and shook so much that Mrs. Stark took her back into the warm drawing room but not before they had made me promise to bring her to them when she was found. Well, a day, I began to think she never would be found when I bethought me to look into the great front court, all covered with snow. I was upstairs when I looked out, but it was such clear moonlight I could see quite plain 
two little footprints which might be traced off from the hall door and round the corner of the east wing. I don't know how I got down, but I tugged open the great stiff hall door and throwing the skirt of my gown over my head for a cloak. I ran out. I turned the east corner, and there a black shadow fell on the snow. But when I came again into the moonlight, there were the little footmarks going up to the up uh, up to the fells. It was bitter cold, so cold that the air almost took the skin off my face as I ran. But I ran on, crying to think how my poor little darling must be perished and frightened. I was in, within sight of the holly trees when I saw a shepherd coming down the hill bearing something in his arms wrapped in, wrapped in his mauled, M-A-U-D. He shouted to me and asked me if I had lost a bairn, baby. And I saw my wee bairn lying still and white and stiff in his arms as if she had been dead. He told me he had been up to the fells to gather in his sheep before the deep cold of night came on, and that under the holly trees, black marks on the hillside where no other bush was for miles, miles around, he had found my little lady, my lamb, my queen, my darling, stiff and cold, in the terrible sleep which is frost begotten. Oh, the joy and the tears of having her in my arms once again, for I would not let him carry her, but took her, mauled and all, into my own arms and held her near my own warm neck and heart and felt the life slow, stealing slowly back again into her little gentle limbs. But she was still insensible when we reached the hall and I had no breath for speech. We went in by the kitchen door. Bring the warming pan, said I, and I carried her upstairs and began undressing her by the nursery fire, which Bessie had kept up. I called my little lammy all the sweet and playful names I could think of, even while my eyes were blinded by my tears. And at last, oh, at length she opened her large blue eyes. Then I put her into her warm bed and sent Dorothy down to tell Miss Furnival that all was well, and I made up my mind to sit by my darling's bedside the live long night. She fell away into a soft sleep as soon as her pretty head had touched the pillow, and I watched by her till morning light when she wakened up bright and clear, or so I thought at first, and my dear, so I think now. She said she had fancied that she should like to go to Dorothy for that both the old ladies were asleep, and it was very dull in the drawing room, and that as she was going through the west lobby, she saw the snow through the high window falling, falling soft and steady, but she wanted to see it lying pretty and white on the ground. So she made her way into the great hall, and then going to the window, she saw it bright and soft upon the drive. But while she stood there, she saw a little girl. Not so old as she was, but so pretty, said my darling. This little girl beckoned to me to come out, and oh, she was so pretty and so sweet. I could not choose but go. And then this other little girl had taken her by the hand, and side by side the two had gone round the east corner. Now you are a naughty little girl in telling stories, said I. What would your good mamma that's in heaven and never told a story in her life say to a little Rosamond if she heard her? And I dare say she does, telling stories. Indeed, Hester, sobbed out my child. I'm telling you true, indeed I am. Don't tell me, said I very stern. I tracked you by your footmarks through the snow. They were only yours to be seen. And if you had had a little girl to go hand in hand with you up the hill, don't you think the footprints would have gone along with yours? I can't help it, dear, dear Hester, said she, crying. If they did not, I never looked at her feet, but she held my hand 
fast and tight in her little one, and it was very, very cold. She took me up the fell path up to the holly trees, and there I saw a lady weeping and crying. But when she saw me, she hushed her weeping and smiled very proud and grand, and took me on her knee and began to lull me to sleep. And that's all. And that's all, Hester, but that is true, and my dear mamma knows it is, said she, crying. So I thought the child was in a fever and pretended hang on, to believe her as she went over her story over and over again, and always the same. At last, Dorothy knocked at the door where Miss Rosamond, with Miss Rosamond's breakfast. And she told me the old ladies were down in the eating parlor and they wanted to speak to me. They had both been into the night nursery the evening before, but it was after Miss Rosamond was asleep, so they had only looked at her, not asked me any questions. I shall catch it, thought I to myself as I went along the north gallery, and yet, I thought taking courage it was in their charge I left her, and it's they that's to blame for letting her steal away unknown and unwatched. So I went in boldly, boldly and told my story. I told it out to Miss Furnival, shouting it close to her ear, but when I came to the mention of the other little girl out in the snow, coaxing and tempting her out and wheeling her up the grand and beautiful lady by the holly tree. She threw her arms up, her old and with her arms, and cried aloud, Oh, heaven forgive, have mercy. Mrs. Stark took hold of her roughly enough, I thought, but she was past Mrs. Stark's management and spoke to me in a kind of wild warning and authority. Hester, keep her from the child. It will lure her to her death, that evil child. Tell her it is a wicked, naughty child. Then Mrs. Stark hurried me out of the room, where indeed I was glad enough to go, but Miss Furnival kept shrieking out, Oh, have mercy, wilt thou never forgive? It is many a long year ago. I was very uneasy in my mind after that. I durst never leave Miss Rosamond night or day for fear lest she might slip off again after some fancy or other. <clears throat> other. And all the more because I thought I could make out that Miss Furnival was crazy from their odd ways about her. And I was afraid lest something of the same kind, in parentheses, which might be in the family, you know, hung over my darling, and the great frost never ceased all this time, and whenever it was a more stormy night than usual, between the gust and through the wind, we heard the old Lord playing on the great organ, but, oh, Lord, or not, wherever Miss Rosamond went, there I followed for my love for her, pretty helpless orphan was stronger than my fear for the grand and terrible sound. Besides, it rested with me to keep her cheerful, cheerful and merry as beseemed her age. So we played together and wandered together here and there and everywhere, for I never dared to lose sight of her again in that large and rambling house. And so it happened that one afternoon, not long before Christmas Day, we were playing together on the billiard table in the great hall, in parentheses. Not that we knew the right way of playing, but she liked to roll the smooth ivory balls with her pretty hands, and I liked to do whatever she did, and by and by, without our noticing, noticing it, it grew dusk indoors. Though it was still light in the open air, and I was thinking of taking her back into the nursery, when all of a sudden she cried out. I'm looking to see how much more there is. I'm about read out. Yeah, we'll stop there and try to get the rest of it tomorrow. My 
go. Down. Where was I? Oh, well. Y'all have a good night. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Love you. Bye-bye.